Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Simon. I'm the director of the Research Experience and Education Facility, better known as the REEF, here at UCSB through the Marine Science Institute. Um, the REEF is a teaching aquarium here at UCSB, and over the years, for the past 15 years actually, um, we have had about 20 to 25,000 visitors a year through our doors, mainly um, K through 12, but we also um, support uh, university courses here on campus as well as other uh, universities. Uh, and we'll go inside in a minute, but I wanna um, introduce the rest of my team. Um, my program coordinator, uh, Iris Chan. Yeah, thanks Scott. Hi guys, my name is Iris. I am the Reef Program Coordinator Intern. So I help Scott with coordinating everyone that's coming in, what he's talking about, the K through 12 groups, that kind of stuff. I am a senior, a fourth year at UCSB, so I am an undergraduate and I am majoring in environmental studies with a minor in music. Uh, and a fun fact about me is that I'm actually president of the rowing team here. Uh, it's a club team, super awesome. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, <laughs> ask any questions. Um, but yeah, back to you, Scott. Thank you, Iris. Um, also joining us today is Miette Walton. Miette? Hi, everyone. My name is Miette. I am the UCSB Reef Content Coordinator. So that means that I work with Scott to develop curriculum and content for the surrounding community, especially for K through 12 school groups. And that includes professional development for teachers as well. And I am also a UCSB senior. I'm an ecology and evolution major and educational studies minor. And a fun fact about me is I'm from the San Francisco Bay area. If you guys know Redwood City, that's where I'm from. So anybody else would <laughs> be great. All right. And um, just a huge shout out and kudos to both Iris and Miette. Um, they are literally the wind beneath my wings here um, during normal times. Uh, they were essential. And obviously during the time of the Kanono, they've been very helpful. Uh, at keeping us going, um, developing new ways of doing things virtually. Um, and the unfortunate fact, as they both shared, is that they're seniors. And while that's awesome, it also means I lose them. However, um, there's always new undergraduates coming in. And so I'm very excited to introduce uh, Miette's replacement, Andy Van Horn, or as I like to say, Andy Van Horn Shark. Hi everyone, I'm Andy. I am, like Scott said, going to be, um, I'm training to take over Miette's role as content coordinator next year. I'm a second year aquatic biology major and I'm also minoring in education studies. And I'm from Roseville, California, kind of near Sacramento, and I'm at home right now. Thank you, Andy. And replacing Iris um, is going to be Josie. Josie is a uh, incoming freshman so she hasn't even completed her first quarter here yet. Um, she is a part of a cohort that I have yet to actually meet uh, physically. Uh, she uh, Zoomed over the summer when we did our, um, our uh, freshman orientation tour uh, and we solicited uh, people to come and work at the reef virtually. She uh, bit, she took the bait as we like to say. Um, and lo and behold, here she is. Um, as a freshman in her first quarter, going to be replacing Iris as my program coordinator. Take it away, Josie. Hi, I'm Josie. Like Scott said, I have not even completed my first quarter here at UCSB. I am total freshman. I did the same orientation type of thing that's going on right now, but I'm super excited. Um, I'm currently undeclared, um, but yeah, I'm very excited to you know get in there, take over for Iris do what she does. Awesome, thank you. So um, as I mentioned, I'm the director of the reef. I also am a Santa Barbara native. Um, I've been very blessed to grow up here in Santa Barbara. I actually uh, went to Santa Barbara City College and then transferred to UCSB as well. So I don't know if we have any um, potential transfer students out there. Uh, I do have background and insight um, into uh, being a UCSB student, but I think that uh, Josie and Andy and Miette and Iris, um, I'll certainly have more insight um, and if nothing else are a lot hipper uh, than I am. But one of the cool things about my job is I get to be down here at the reef 
um, unlike everybody else. And um, if you're interested in coming to UCSB, I couldn't think of a better day to try and sell it um, because it is absolutely wonderful outside. And so you can see off in the distance behind the trees is San Nicolas dorm. Um, if you're fortunate enough um, to get accepted to UCSB and the Kanono goes away, that big white building right there that looks like a hotel um, could be your dormitory. And now I'm gonna go 180 degrees pan across our lagoon. It's not really a lagoon, but that's a lesson for a different day. You can see the beautiful Pacific out beyond the depression there. As we come around here, you can see this is Campus Point Beach. So um, we are an exclusive university in that we are the only university um, on the coast of uh, in California that is on the beach. Santa Cruz is close, San Diego is close, but UCSB is literally on the beach, right? You can stand on the beach. Um, and so this is a beautiful place and that would be your view from the dorms there. Um, Life still happens here at UCSB. So that looks like a UCSB student getting out and getting a little exercise. Campus Point is an amazing little surf spot um, to hang out there. Behind the aquarium are, is the boat yard. We've got our research boats out there. So if you're interested in aquatic biology um, and you get working in a lab and you get scuba certified and then research certified, um, you get to go out on our boats and go diving. Maybe help me collect animals for the aquarium or collect data for one of the many research programs here. I am gonna spend a little more time um, with the research programs here as we go into the reef. Uh, one of the things that my interns did that we like to do here is um, introduce yourself, what your major is or your major interest um, and, and where you're from. So uh, I think we already sent out that poll, yes, Iris? Sending that one out right now. Awesome. So you guys can go to polls, fill them out. You guys are already doing that, awesome. Yeah, so, and one of the reasons I like to ask that is um, because I love driving, love driving. And I might have a really nice car for driving in. Um, and if you come here, you'll get to see that car. But I've been all over the state. I've been alive for a long time. And so I really like connecting um, with people and their places. So hopefully we'll, uh, learn a little bit more about you guys via the Q&A. Um, and I think without further ado, Iris, should we go into the reef? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And Iris, feel free to interrupt me anytime there's a Q&A or if anybody's, I don't think we're using the chat function, right? Uh, no, we're not. Yeah. So okay. everyone put things in the Q&A. You guys can put uh, what location you are exactly. So wherever you are from in California, or we have a lot of out-of-state people on this right now too. Uh, just put it into the Q&A. You can just say you're from here, there, et cetera, and we'll see. Yeah, and type your name in there so we can give you a shout out by your first name. Oh, the last thing um, I meant to say is um, I'm a father. So I'm a native of Santa Barbara, I'm a father. My daughter just graduated. So she is one year older than you guys if you're considering UCSB um, for next year. She went off to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, and so, um, so I know what you guys are going through. These are very weird times. Um, this is the sweetest office I've ever seen. Thank you very much. So I don't know if you guys heard that guy say this is the sweetest office they've ever seen. It is, I mean, I'm blessed. This is where I have to come to work every day. Poor me. Anyway, um, so uh, I may be throwing dad jokes at you guys. And there's a fine line between a dad joke and a bad joke, um, but I'll let you guys decide. All right, shall we dive in, Iris? Dive in. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get our feet wet here. Here we go, into the reef. Um, so it is a touch tank teaching aquarium, as I said. And uh, if you are a school group, one of the things that I might do with you guys is um, tell you the story of Goldilocks and the three C's. Uh, so we like to teach people about the different oceans because we do research in all three of them. And if you're like, what three oceans? I don't get that. Um, we have a cool little story that riffs off of Goldilocks and the three bears, but um, it starts with her going to the tropical waters, which we all know those are too warm for goldie fish. Then she goes to the polar waters. Those are too cold. 
and then she comes to the beautiful temperate waters off the coast of California, and those are just right. So um, some of our research, one of the big projects that we work with, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of NSF or the National Science Foundation, um, but they have taxpayer dollars to fund research. And one of the projects, programs that they have is called the LTER, or Long Term Ecological Research Network. And we have um, a couple of those sites uh, that we do research for. So the first and foremost in our tropical flavored seas um, is the Morea Coral Reef, LTER. And if you're not sure where Morea is, look it up on a map. No, I'll tell you, it's in Tahiti. It's right next to Tahiti. So it's characterized by warm waters, um, coral reefs, and amazing fish. And obviously we're finding Nemo here, um, but our um, star attraction in our MCR tank is Clyde. That is Clyde, our stars and stripes puffer fish. Um, and Clyde loves being on camera there. There he is, oh, nice shot, that's his best side. Um, so if you're interested in not only aquatic biology, um, we, have the, uh, we have environmental studies. Um, Iris is a part of the environmental studies degree. Um, there are lots of opportunities um, to get involved in research. And if you really like the tropics, and you're an undergrad, then you can potentially get in that lab. If you're into diving or want to get into diving and you get certified, and as I said, if you get certified as a research diver and you work with a grad student, you could find yourself in Morea. I have been there and it is beautiful, amazingly beautiful, like a dream come true tropical paradise. 80 degree water, 60 foot visibility, oh, just the bomb diggity. Um, but enough about the tropics, let's focus on our temperate. Um, as I mentioned, we have a number of LTER sites and my favorite, um, and I work for the Santa Barbara Coastal LTER, um, which studies the kelp forests here right off, off of our coast. Um, they're focused on the impacts, human and um, oceanographic impacts of the kelp forest. And there are some really cool critters that we have in our kelp forest. You can see there's an opal eye right down there. Um, one of the things that the kids really love, um, while this is not my mother-in-law, it's a reasonable facsimile, uh, and that's the California moray eel. And there might be a lobster in there, but we've got some other examples. Um, Iris, what do we have from our Q&A, anything? Yeah, we've got some cool locations that everyone's adding so far. Yeah. If you hear some of them. We have um, Let's Anna's. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you can get to check it oh, out. Oh, look, look, I can bring ones. that up. Okay. Boomers learning how to zoom here. Anna May um, is from Oxnard, California. That's so awesome. That's just down the road. We get a lot of Oxnard schools up here, and we've gone down to work with them. Welcome. Um, Carrie's Goldsmith, Oakland, California. Awesome. Actually, um, there's a really cool connection. If we have time later, I'll do that. Palos Verdes Peninsula. I love, so I'll tell you, my car is a 1969 Camaro convertible um, and Palos Verdes is a beautiful drive um, to go down there. Karina Roddy from San Diego, awesome. Um, Caitlin Callen, oh, I lost Caitlin there. Boy, they're just slamming in now. Newport Beach oftentimes called New Porsche Beach because there is an amazing Porsche dealership down there. Um, Pasadena, one of my um, favorite aquarist interns uh, is from Pasadena as well. I love that area. Van Eyes, actually in my younger days, I might have been a rock star and uh, we did recording down in Van Nuys at Sound City Studios. Lily from San Diego. And just to be clear, there is a lot of area to San Diego just like Van Nuys is a part of Los Angeles. So if you're not from San Diego proper, let us know exactly where you're from so we can give you a shout out. Oregon, Oregon's a big state. Actually, my wife just got back last night um, from Grants Pass, Oregon, where her mother lives um, and where she spent time growing up. So uh, West Lynn, um, oh, it's West Lynn, Oregon, I get it. 
I thought West Lynn was the name. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, there's so many of Valencia. Claire Miller, we've got a bunch of Valencians that work here at the reef. Um, a colleague of mine lives in Valencia and my grandmother lived in Hollywood. And every time I went to visit her, we always went to Magic Mountain in Valencia. Look at all of those coming in. All right, we'll keep giving shout outs, um, but let's keep zooming here, yeah? Iris, are there any specific questions that have come in? Yeah, we actually got a question from Sadie uh, and she was asking if students can get research certified at UCSB or if they have to get it outside of the university. Excellent question. And where is Sadie from? Do um, we know? Sadie, yeah, Sadie is from Los Angeles. Sadie, awesome. Where in Los Angeles, Sadie? She's from Hollywood. Hollywood, awesome. So, oh, I should have brought the picture in. Anyway, during the 80s, I played in a hair band um, down in Hollywood. Um, and so I love Hollywood. That's beautiful. Um, Iris, are you, or Miette, are both of you are scuba certified, yeah? Yeah, I am. Are, are you research certified, Miette? I was in the process of getting my side eye cert when COVID hit. So okay, do you want to wanna address Sadie's question? Yeah. So when there, there are a lot of opportunities to get scientific diving certified at UCSB, and it's basically just a process where if you're currently in a lab, you can have your PI email the DSO at UCSB, who's the dive safety officer, and then you. What does PI mean? Oh, principal investigator, sorry. <laughs> the principal investigator. So that's basically the head of the lab that they run. And then sometimes they like to take undergrads to do field research with them. And in order to do that, you have to get your scientific diving certification. So it's a super fun class. It's a few weeks. Um, and then you meet over spring break and you get to go to Catalina and do really amazing diving. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get to do that, but we got to learn some really awesome skills before we ended the class. And you also get your research certification, and I believe you're advanced and also nitrox all in one, one fell swoop. So it's a great class, and I highly recommend, especially if you're interested in doing research. Now, did you learn to dive in that class, Mia? No, so I already was open water certified, so I learned how to scuba dive earlier and then and is, is that a requirement before the research dive class yes that's what i was about to say you have to have your open water cert and a certain amount of dives i believe it's 20 in temperate waters which is uh gosh i think it's less than 60 or less than 70 degrees fahrenheit um you have to have a certain amount in the seven mil as well as seven mil wetsuit before you enter the class and you have to have them all logged so definitely a lot of requirements can I get open water certified here at UCSB? Yes, you actually can get open water certified. We do offer Stop. a class. Stop. I, yeah, yeah. I believe it's in spring or maybe winter and it takes a few weeks of the quarter and they meet at night, but it's a great opportunity. I hear the class is super fun and you learn a lot and then you can go on from there to get your side dive. Very cool. Hopefully that helps Sadie out. Iris, any other questions? Uh, yeah, we've got a good amount about scuba and working in labs. Um, I think that's pretty awesome. You guys are already interested in it. I just sent out a poll about scuba diving. If you have tried it, you haven't. I mean, if you haven't tried it yet, you're like me, but I'm going to be soon. So I hopefully that's everyone else's mindset with this, especially if you're thinking about coming to UCSB, scuba is kind of the thing to do here, um, just because it's a super cool opportunity that you're not really getting at anywhere else. Um, but Scott, would you want to address more things about scuba on our campus? Well, we've got the um, scuba diving club or the scuba and free diving club here at UCSB. Back in my days, I was the president of it. Uh, I now serve as the advisor. And so that is a um, that's through the Office of Student Life. It's a club here at UCSB, um, a way to network with people. Um, if you, even if you don't dive, um, you can get involved with them. You get a cool shirt. Um, you get lots of benefits. You get free food once a month during the um, during the dive club meetings. There's um, raffles for dive equipment. We talk about different local dive sites. As I said, I grew up here, and diving can be expensive. The equipment um, will set you back a bit, but if you're coming as an aquatic bio major, 
um, you can do what I did and that's hit your parents up and say, it's kind of like a textbook. It's part of being a marine biologist and don't you want me to be successful? So totally play them for that. Um, but there are a lot of places that I go diving, beach dives. Campus Point is actually one of them. Um, it's very cool. You just walk down into the water, you go off diving um, and there's, there's a kelp forest right out there. Our seawater system that we have, very sophisticated, um, a world-class seawater system that allows us to bring the water into buildings like the reef. Um, there's two pipelines that go out to the intakes. You can dive along those. They're really cool. Um, I was showing you a picture of a swell shark uh, before they like to live under the pipe. Um, they have babies and I've got some babies here in this tank. Um, this is a little juvenile swell shark right here that you can see um, hanging out. Um, the reason they're called swell sharks is because they'll inhale water to um, wedge themselves in the rocks so you can't get them out. They're nocturnal. Um, this is a very common aspect of them. Um, and that is, there we go. A lot of people might have seen these on the beach. And the question is, what would you call that? A plankton pouch, barnacle boy's satchel, <laughs> or a mermaid's purse? And um, I'm new to the whole Q&A polling thing. So are, Iris, are we waiting for responses and then we can see? Yeah, we are getting responses and there's awesome. an overwhelming consensus on one of them. <laughs> that it is Barnacle Boy's satchel, yes? Exactly, exactly. Awesome. Influence with SpongeBob. <laughs> okay, well, that is um, one that you would find on the beach, but when they're in the water, they look like that. Uh, very much looks like a piece of kelp, which is a good way of protecting your young because no um, red-blooded, carnivore in the ocean is going to want to eat something like a piece of kelp like that. Um, and then if you are a red-blooded, cold-blooded herbivore living in the ocean and you go to eat this thing, it isn't kelp. It's tough material like our fingernails. Um, and inside you can see there's a yolk and this one's really cool because, let's try this here, so we can get a little light. Can you see a little baby shark wiggling in there? Let's come over here and get a little more light behind it. Boom, boom, boom. I, I can't see because it's so dark. Mia, is that working? It looks great. Yeah, I think that's, I can see. Yeah, so that's a little baby shark there, do, 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 attached to an umbilical um, that's attached to the yolk uh, and it'll take about nine months to grow. So do we have consensus on what the heck um, they're called? We are thinking mermaid's purse. Yes, they are mermaid's purses indeed. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a scuba club. You can learn lots of things. So even if you're not an aquatic bio major, as Iris said, go out there and get scuba certified. We've got amazing dive spots. You can go right off the beach. Um, and you can learn right here on campus through the Rexen. Do we have other questions, Iris Chan? And actually, so, are, I'm sorry, are Miet and Andy and uh, Josie also monitoring? Yes. Okay, let's go. Let's go to Miet. Miet, do we have any other questions? Yes, actually, Violet just asked, "How hard is it to get an opportunity to work in a lab as an underclassman?" Aha, uh -huh. and um, where's Violet from? Oh, Violet, where are you from? Violet Glickman, let me see if I can find you. Oh, Palo Alto. Palo Alto, oh, awesome, Palo right Alto. up there by Miet. Well, Miet, um, do you wanna share? Cause I think you um, have worked in a research lab, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I started working my sophomore year at the very beginning of it. Uh, in the Morea Coral Reef LTER. And it's not typically super hard to find spots in labs. It definitely depends on the department. But since UCSB has a really strong undergraduate community, um, the grad students are always looking for help with their research. And typically they will send out announcements and you'll get it through the bio 
or whatever your major is, they send out like group emails to the entire major. So you can see announcements through there. Or a lot of times you can email PIs who are the leaders of their labs or graduate students that you know are working in their labs um, directly and asking them if they need help. Uh, or sometimes you can get recommendations from friends. I heard of another lab that I worked in starting at the middle of my sophomore year from a good friend of mine who worked at the wreath and she also worked in this lab and told me that they needed some help. So it's typically not super difficult, but you've got to be vigilant about it and keep your eye out for those opportunities. Yes, and I'm very picky about who I hire at the Reef. Um, and so it's a great bunch of undergraduates, obviously, as you can tell from uh, Mia and Iris so far, and the networking that happens here um, is, uh, if I may be so bold, second to none. A um, lot of opportunities, and it's really cool um, to see these guys um, get these opportunities and um, go to places like Morea um, and uh, beyond. Um, Andy, do we have another question? Andy, Andy you're muted. Caitlin Callen was asking, are there any shark specific study programs or classes at UCSB? Shark specific study programs, is that what I heard? Yes. Yes, um, actually there are. And one of my um, recently graduated shark aquarists, so I have a couple of different, like I have a position, a content coordinator, program coordinator. I have some aquarist positions and one of them is to help take care of the sharks. And um, a previous intern uh, who is now working down at the Birch Aquarium um, was working in um, Aaron Dillon's lab. And they are doing research on shark scale shedding. Um, and this is so cool. So the, the short answer is yes. Uh, but the work that she was doing, um, she got to set up an experiment here. As you guys know, just like sharks shed their teeth, they also shed their dermal denticles, which is just a fancy word for shark scales. And um, so this is cool if you're like into forensics and stuff. Um, so they um, also worked down at the aquarium of the Pacific, she got to go diving in their big tropical tank to see at what rate the sharks shed their scales. And they set up these little traps to collect the scales because if you think about it, that's just like sedimentation, right? The earth laying down silt through erosion, et cetera, right? And we can look back through dirt samples and tell when there were like big fires or different things like that. Well, they can look through the, um, the sand layers or the coral layers in the sea floor um, and go back in time and try and paint a picture of what the shark ecology um, of a reef system looked like um, thousands of years ago. So Aaron Dillon is doing that work um, on sharks uh, in one of the labs here. Great question. Josie, do we have another question? Yes. Um... Hannah Pack asks, what's the most unique sea animals you guys have? Oh my gosh. Um, and where is Hannah Pack from? Um, I'm not sure where she's from. If she wants to drop that in the Q&A. Hannah Pack, tell us where you're from. She says she's from LA. LA, all right. And LA, LA, or like uh, maybe a part of LA? a more specific part of LA? Ooh, Westchester. Westchester, awesome, awesome. All right, well, welcome. So the question was, um, Josie, what is the most interesting? What's the most unique sea animal? Unique sea animal in the reef. Um, that is sort of a trick question. I mean, they're all so amazing and have such unique characteristics, right? From our sea anemones to our sea stars, we've got bat stars, pisaster stars, we've got mussels, scallops. Um, the ecology and the life histories of these things are amazing. Uh, we've got Kellett's whelks. I think one of the cool things about those is they're a marine snail. A lot of kids are like, oh, look, it's a hermit crab. No, that's a snail. When they die, 
Um, a hermit crab will take over a snail's shell, but a hermit crab will not kill a snail to get its shell, just a little fun fact. Um, but as fisheries change, um, we are looking for new sources of protein. And so the Kellett's whelk um, is becoming a fisheries here in Southern California. Um, if you've ever had escargot, I have yet to try it. Um, I'm curious to try it because I'm working with a grad student right now, and that is a research um, tank setup that we designed where she's gonna have Kellett's whelk in there, um, and she's gonna do some temperature studies um, to see how uh, climate change might impact that emerging fishery. Um, and so we're gonna go out uh, and try uh, some Kellett's whelk. I don't even know how to prepare it, but they're a very, as we say, ubiquitous, creature. You can find them everywhere. You can see there's a whole bunch of them right down there. Um, but I don't know. Andy, what do you think is the most unique creature in the reef to you? Um, I don't know about unique. I know when the Darabaldis were there, I thought that was really cool when we saw it on okay. the dance school. All right. That's Iris, just a favorite you, of mine. Do you have a unique one? My favorite would be sea hares. I'm not yeah, sure if you have them right nice. now Nice, yet. <laughs> I'm going to punt to you. You're going to set me up here? Yes, my favorite unique sea creature we have in the reef is Boris, our California spiny lobster. All right, so check yeah. this out. Lobster are another fisheries here in Southern California. The California spiny lobster enjoys warmer temperate waters, so they don't. you don't find them north of Santa Barbara really, but they go down into Baja. This is the California spiny lobster. They have no claws like the American lobster found on the East Coast. Um, they are tasty, not as tasty. Um, this is kind of a cool little fun fact about marine organisms. Um, if you guys drive cars, you know that you put coolant in the engine to keep it from overheating or, over, um, or freezing, right? And um, the question is, what is that chemical that is in the coolant? And it is called glycol. And if you're a science nerd um, or a diabetic, you know that glycol is um, gly or glue is sugar. Um, and so it's, that's why it's dangerous to animals because it's toxic, but it tastes sweet. Um, so they eat it. Anyway, I digress. The, American lobster has more um, glycoproteins, more sugar proteins in their meat than the California spiny lobster because they live in colder water and they don't want to freeze. So it's a natural tasty antifreeze, which makes them tastier. Now you guys can see this is Rufus. Rufus, as I said, is a California spiny lobster and I've got him in my hand. Yes. A, like a kind of about the size of a baseball. Um, well, like Clyde, we have another celebrity here um, and that is Boris. And Boris is also a California spiny lobster. They're found in the kelp forest. They like to live in rock crevices and caves, but there's Boris. And Boris is slightly bigger and I apologize the camera's probably gonna flip here, but I'm gonna try and get down here and show you how big Boris is, all right? There, and Boris gets upset, um, as do all lobsters, when I try and hold them, um, but you can see Boris is quite large. One of the questions we ask school kids when they come is, how do you get from the size of Rufus to the size of Boris? Well, they molt. They shed their exoskeleton once a year. They grow a whole new shell on the inside, soft and squishy, um, because otherwise they'd grow smaller. And then they climb out. Um, they dissolve the membrane that holds their abdomen or tail to their carapace. So that's their carapace and that's their abdomen although we call it the lobster tail, right there, there's a membrane that holds those two pieces together. They secrete a chemical and it dissolves it and they crawl out of the gap. They only do it once a year 
They do it en masse. So if you've ever been walking along the beaches of Southern California and you've seen lobster shells everywhere, that's because they all just molted. And it's super exciting because it, it happens about this time around here. And lo and behold, last week, Boris molted. And so that is Boris's molt, and it's much easier to show you how ginormous Boris is. Um, and there is the open space that they crawl out of. So if you ever see one on the beach, pick it up, smell it. It should just smell like the ocean. It should be light because there's no meat in there. It's just the molt. It's just the shell of an organism like my mother-in-law. Um, so I don't know, that's pretty cool. Um, and I guess the coolest thing is when they only grow once a year, you can calculate how much, and they only grow about an eighth of an inch a year, you can calculate about how old they are. And Boris in, is um, somewhere between 80 and 90 years old. And I've seen bigger lobster. So boom. Iris, more questions? Yeah, actually, Leilani was wondering if we have sea cucumbers. Can you show one off for us? Nice. And where is Leilani from? Where is Leilani from? She is from the Van Nuys area in California. Yeah. Awesome. The Van Nuys area. Panorama City, perhaps? Yes, exactly. Ah, 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 <laughs> nice, Scott. See, look at that. <laughs> look at that. So there is a sea cucumber. Um, this is a very interesting animal. It is a detritivore. So it feeds on, right? Everybody poops. And if you're a shark, you're not a, um, a neat consumer. So there's lots of bits of fish and stuff. Other predators too, um, when they eat, that fall down to the seafloor. Sea cucumbers go along um, and they scoop up the poop and skin and, and pieces of tissue um, and eat that and they help keep the seafloor clean. You can find them in, um, they are what we call circumglobal. Uh, you can find them in temperate waters, in tropical waters. And um, I'm gonna have Andy look up and see if there is any info on sea cucumbers being polar um, as well. So we can cover our three C's. Uh, but this is the, um, this is the, uh, help me out, Miet. I'm having a, a brain fart. The, are you looking for the? This is a, some kind of cucumber. Oh, the common name. Um, oh gosh, I'm also warty. drawing This is the warty <laughs> cucumber. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and a lot of people think it's like a slug um, because it is gushy. But if we look really close, we can see it doesn't have one big slimy foot. It has a bunch of little tube feet. And you can see that there are lateral lines. It's hard to see on this one, um, on its body. Anyway, uh, if I could get closer and have good resolution, you'd see that there are five lateral lines that run from its nose to its tushy. Um, and so it has five parts. And if you could imagine, right, sea stars have tube feet on the bottom and they have five parts. And if you could imagine folding a sea star up, it's kind of like an open banana peel. Um, the sea cucumber is like a closed banana. So they are echinoderms. They're related to the sea stars and the sea urchins. And this one um, also, you can see those look like spines. Now, if you're a human, you're like, those do not look like spines, they're all gushy. But if you're a sea animal, you're like, oh, those look like big spines, I don't wanna eat that. So it helps um, protect them. And we have two, sometimes it's confusing, sea cucumbers that look very similar. There is the warty cucumber, which I just showed you, and the California um, cucumber. And I don't have it here now because one of my colleagues took it for the invert zoology class. Even though it's taking place virtual, they are using live animals from the reef and the holding facility next door. 
And Scott, to answer your question, there are polar sea cucumbers. Ah, right on. So the cucumbers found in three seas. And we've got um, a, a number of other sea cucumbers, much smaller, a little white one called uh, um eupentactyla, I think if I got it right. Um, but yes, and there's the uh, uh, synaptid uh, cucumbers found in the tropical waters. And then what's the name of the polar one? Do you have it right there? You don't need to look it up if you don't have it. Mike? I had it, but now I don't. I didn't okay, send it no in the worries. chat. Okay, no worries. No worries. Awesome. All right, Josie, do we have any more questions? Um, we do. Let's see. Olivia Peters from South LA asks if there are any octopuses in the reef and mm. study them. And what? If you study them. So yes, um, we while we do do research here, oh, I said do do. Um, while we conduct research here uh, in the reef, like I showed you with um, Sochi Claire's tank, um, we actually. Um, and we do it with the abalone. We might explore those guys later. We have had octopus in here. We normally have octopus. Um, octopus only live about a year. They do really well in captivity. And so we've had some here um, for two years. This is a really long way of saying I don't have any right now. And it's very sad. Our octopus um, passed away about a month ago. Um, it had been here for uh, well over a year, um, but, uh, Hopefully we'll be able to go out diving soon uh, and collect more. Um, we don't do research on octopus here at the reef, but um, one of, so the Marine Science Institute does a lot of research in a lot of different areas. As I explained, there's the Santa Barbara Coastal LTER, SBC LTER that does work um, on kelp forest. There's the Morea Coral Reef LTR that does tropical work. But we have um, amazing scientists that work in all of the different oceans, in all of the different with all of the different creatures, in a lot of different aspects. And we've got somebody here who's very special. His name is Dr. Dan Morse, M-O-R-S-E, and he is a uh, neurobiologist. Um, he gets a lot of his money from the military to study things like octopus and squid because of their ability to. Uh, for biomimicry um, and right, they can change color, they can kind of change their forms. And so that's a lot of interest, uh, right? If you think about uh, um, what's his face from that, what's that place that had the, what you call it, right? Harry Potter and the cloak of invisibility or whatever it was. Help me out there, Josie, you're hip and young. I, I think it's a, blanket of some sort a cloak, oh right? josie not a harry potter fan huh are you talking about are harry potter's invisibility cloak yes That's what it's called there we go yes so um so there's some cool stuff like that so not i mean there's a lot of cool stuff with marine ecology and marine biology and stuff like that but there's some really cool physics studies um that are going on here at ucsb um and so um like we've kind of shared, the reef is sort of a really good entree into marine biology and it's a really cool pathway into some of the labs um, once you learn more about some of the research going on. Um, and they really like the undergrads that work here uh, because as I said, I'm really picky and um, I'm really hard on you guys, huh, Andy? Yes, but builds character. Okay, other questions, Miet. Yeah, so Casey asked, are there any opportunities for study abroad or semester at sea that are specific to marine science and marine bio? Hey, hey, hey. that's a great question. <laughs> um, first, I gotta know where Casey's from. Oh yeah, Casey, where are you from? Casey Cruz.
No dead air. That's mm -hmm. not good. Let's um oh. let's yeah. Oh no, never mind. Just uh, just go for it. So this is a great question for Miet because Miet, I think you have firsthand experience, don't you? I do yes, and I love and, to talk about it. Yes, awesome. Um, so I did the UCEAP MBTE program, which is the Marine Bio and Terrestrial Ecology field program in Australia. So it's in Queensland based out of Brisbane, but you travel so much. So you do multiple different field trips. Half of them, you get to go to uh, parks in Queensland and you get to do field research and work on field work. And it's basically just hiking all the time with your professors and your classmates. And then you get to go to two islands, one of which is remote in the Great Barrier Reef. It's called Heron Island. You should definitely look it up. And you get to conduct your own field projects on those. So we do these big research projects over the span what? of 10 or so days. Yes. Independent ones um, that are you know, led by grads or your grad students help you, but you're basically just doing it by yourself with your group members. So tons of really awesome experience. You get to spend two plus months in Australia and then it ends before Thanksgiving. And I just got to travel <laughs> for a month afterwards. So it was absolutely incredible. One of the best experiences I've ever had in my college career. And I cannot recommend it enough. And you get 21 units of marine bio credit, basically. It is absolutely incredible. I'll drop a link in the chat too. Thank you. Um, and the short answer is yes, but I like Miette's answer so much better. Um, uh, another thing that um, that we I, th I guess we want to share is obviously I'm the only one in here right now. Um, Miette, Iris, Andy, and uh, Josie are um, remote. Uh, but after the Kanono came down last April and they shut the university down and sent everybody home, um, we came up on with this idea for the virtual reef. Uh, so we created a YouTube channel um, and we started doing content for teachers online. That's why I could still keep hiring people um, because although we can't um, do things in person per se, we can still use the reef. Um, we can come up with really cool content that Miette helps with. Iris has been a part of, uh, Andy and Josie being new are a part of a team that are gonna be putting together more content. But maybe um, Iris, you can put that in the chat box if people wanna go check out um, last year's first ever attempt at um, YouTube channels and the virtual reef. There are a lot of different ones. Um, I'm in a couple, but there are a, a lot of the undergrads are in some of the other ones uh, and they're really cool. And so if you're wondering, like, how could I be a part of the reef uh, in the time of the coronavirus, hopefully you guys will be coming to campus next year. Um, but if not, or if we have to slow things down and close things down again, or if you don't come here, but you're like, oh, my gosh, how can I keep the reef dream alive? You can visit our YouTube channel. Whew. Josie, do we have any more questions? Yes, let's take a look. Um, Ashley Nguyen um, asks if we take in injured animals and rehabilitate them frequently. So um, that requires um, a different set of regulations. We do, we do not. Um, there are a number of networks in Santa Barbara that uh, are involved in that. And so a lot of times um, there's the marine mammal um, care network. And so if we have pinnipeds, dolphins, or not dolphins, um, seals or sea lions, a lot of times come up on the beach, they're sick from uh, domoic acid poisoning uh, or things like that. Maybe they got a, um, a little nip from a white shark. Uh, we can call them and ha they'll come down, um, but we are not responsible for um, looking for injured marine life uh, and rehabilitating them. There's also the Wildlife Care Network. They take all the marine birds um, that may be injured um, and we send them to them. Other questions, Andy? Uh, Bridget Bentley from Piedmont, California asks, what's been everyone's favorite memory of the marine science programs at UCSB? Ah, why don't we take that from, uh, let's see, who's graduating sooner, Miette or Iris? 
Um, I'm glad same. I think right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I think has Miette been at the reef longer than Iris? All right. So yes. she yeah. technically has the for better or worse the <laughs> most memories. Um, so let's go with Miette, then Iris, uh, then Andy, who's a second year, um, and we'll end with Josie since she's only been here for a little bit of time. Um, we'll give her the most time to reflect on that. So about working at the Reef and, and the marine science programs? Sure. Okay, so I started working at the Reef uh, January of my freshman year, and I originally wanted to be a marine scientist and get my PhD. Um, and I started working at the Reef and I started getting involved in the education programs, and I uh, then started leading the education programs and then I realized that I did not want to be a full-blown scientist anymore and I loved working with kids and I loved working in education and outreach especially with ocean conservation and especially with like this local and place-based knowledge that we have here at the reef and so I completely made a career change and now I'm working on getting my teaching credential and working in environmental education so really the reef gave me the opportunity to find what my passion is and it allowed me to combine my two passions of working with conservation and uh, working with kids and in an education and it kind of pushed me to become a, a better teacher and a better educator and then Scott also just has given me so many amazing opportunities to work with the teachers in the area and lead professional development workshops as well so it's it's been a really amazing experience and it's been just a huge part of my undergraduate experience for gosh the past three years so Cannot say enough good things about it. Yeah, Miette's had a very full time here. Uh, and um, as she shared, and I see this a lot, I've been doing this for 15 years. I have anywhere from 30 to 50 undergraduates um, working at the Reef uh, each quarter. So throughout the years, most of them stay um, from the time they come in as freshmen uh, to the time they leave as seniors. Uh, and I think the most common thing that I have seen is everybody comes in just like me wanting to be a marine biologist and go get a PhD, um, but nobody really knows what that looks like. Um, a lot of people have an idea of what that looks like and that idea looks like this, right? Oh, cool marine aquarium lab, um, but this is a Hollywood sort of picture of that. Um, my job is very rare um, to have, and it's not really um, what marine science is. A lot of PhDs, uh, that requires a lot of time in front of computers and coming up with ways of getting money to support your research uh, and ways of doing those things. And there aren't necessarily a lot of jobs out there, uh, but, a, um, but a lot of people think they want to do it when they come in. And um, once they see, and this is certainly not to slam on PhDs and research, because that stuff is really cool. And I maintain um, a couple of research programs here with our abalone um, and working with some of the grad students. Uh, but the reality is uh, a lot of people find their passion here um, along a different pathway. Some of them continue on to research and I've got a whole bunch of undergraduates that are out there in the research world with PhDs doing cool things. Um, we make a lot of teachers like Miette here um, and that's been really cool. And Miette is amazing. She actually um, is applying to grad school for, uh, for a teaching master's degree um, and heading up in Washington. So our fingers are crossed. We just submitted a letter of recommendation for her. Um, and a lot of people find their passion in conservation um, and um, environmental management. Um, Iris, do you want to share a little bit more about uh, your background and where you might be headed? Uh, I came into UCSB as a, am I lagging right now? Sorry. Uh, there we go. I came in, let, let me know if you guys can hear me properly, yeah. Um, I came in at UC to UCSB as a pre-biology major, which is basically just the major that you're put under because biology has some prerequisites that you have to go through before really um, declaring your like full major, like marine or aquatic biology. So I came in 
wanting to do just general biology. I was pre-med just because my parents told me that'd be good. But when I came here, I kind of realized how amazing the environmental program was here and how passionate I was for that. So at the end of my second year here, um, that was actually when I applied to work at the Reef and when I changed my major. So very exciting uh, spring quarter, my second year for me. Um, and so that's when I changed to environmental studies. I was already doing my minor in music. Um, and honestly, one of the best decisions of college so far was switching. I was really nervous because I felt like it might be too much work to switch or, you know, like I might be making a wrong decision. I could just stay in biology. But in the end, I'm so happy with the professors that I've had in ES. And I've still been able to take a lot of marine biology classes um, because in the ES program, we have an outside concentration when you get a Bachelor of Science. So you take 16 units in any STEM um, department. So I chose EEMB which is the Ecology and Evolution Marine Biology Department. So I've been able to take four classes from this department and that's given me a lot of experience and a lot of uh, what the question was entailing, what like are my favorite experiences from the Marine Science Program. One of them is actually hearing about the research that my professors have been doing since it's really awesome to actually see that they're really good at lecturing and they've had some really cool outside of school experiences. For example, a uh, professor for our Coral Reefs class, Dr. Darren Berkopile, has done these super awesome dive uh, research things where they have been underwater for like months at a time. And it's just super cool to see that be done and then have him be able to bring that to his lab and the classroom. Um, so just so you guys know, if you're thinking about environmental studies, you can still do a marine biology focus and emphasis with that um, without doing like a minor per se, because there really is no minor in the biology department, but still have a concentration and a connection to it. Um, and having labs like this, like the reef, also give you an opportunity to connect to that. For example, uh, we the reef hosts an annual some undergraduate splash talk symposium, which is just where you talk about your research for like five minutes in a really concise uh, format with super cool, we have undergraduates that attend, grad students that help you as panelists, um, some lab people. I think last year we had the chancellor's wife come, which was super awesome. Um, and I got to present to the, in that my sophomore year. And then I co-directed it my uh, last year, my junior year. So that's something that we've been able to do if you're involved in labs. I've been talking a lot, um, but if you guys have questions about ES, I am the person to go to. Awesome. So <laughs> we have a number of isms, reef isms around here. And one of them is siempre gumbi, always flexible. Um, and I cannot tell you, like I said, 15 years I've been here, I have had a lot of undergraduates come into my office and like, oh, I don't know what to do. I feel so stuck. I don't want to do research anymore. Um, then don't, you know, you're not committed to this. And college is hopefully about finding something that you like to do. Now there are, you can use a college degree to get any old job if you want. But a lot of times, especially in the sciences, you kind of come in with a heart full of, I want to work with nature somehow or some way. Same thing with physics, right? Any of the sciences. And if you change your mind, that's okay, but you want to be having fun doing it, right? I mean, it's not always fun, but when you go out in the world, right, there's a saying, uh, what is it? Find it, do a job you love and you'll never work another day in your life. And I know that sounds kind of trite, but the reality is, Find something you love doing. I mean, I think the common thread so far between Mia and Iris is that they are passionate about what they're doing and it's not necessarily what they came in doing. So don't be afraid to change your mind. College is a time for tasting all of the different intellectual opportunities that are out there and finding your path. Like I said, I got a daughter. She has a very clear idea of what she wants to do going into college last year. That was a very different idea than she had two years ago. So it may change through college. So don't be afraid of that. Um, and uh, Andy, do you wanna share your insight with us? Yeah, so for me, I'm definitely still in that figuring out what I wanna do kind of portion of college. Um, but at least for right now, my favorite part about working with the REACH has just been having access to like work that's actually fulfilling 
during the whole quarantine vibe. I know school for a lot of people is really hard right now being online and not really getting that like fulfilling aspect of school that a lot of us really enjoy. So it's been nice to be able to actually do work that I care about. We've been doing work with a local school and kind of giving them tours of the reef and just um, last week specifically, we got to like go into breakout rooms and help teach them about the scientific method and stuff like that's been really cool and like really motivating to me while we've been in quarantine. Yeah, and so Andy has an interest, uh, a minor in education, yeah? Yeah, yeah so, so um, she is, I am just so stoked to have her here knowing that she's gonna step in uh, to fill Miette's ginormous shoes. Um, and last, but certainly not least, um, the newest reefer to the team uh, is Josie. Josie, do you want to share some of your, um, uh, albeit brief and limited experience and insight? Yes, I'll do what I can. Um, I am a freshman. This is, I'm as, you know, fresh as they come. I'm currently undeclared, so I am really in the thick of just trying to figure out what I want to do. Um, I think that what's really awesome about the reef and what I've really enjoyed about it is, you know, immediately there's all of these amazing opportunities. Um, for example, you know, the program coordinator position is something I'm sort of trying to feel out, learn how to do it with Iris and Scott. Um, so I think that's a really awesome part of the reef and has definitely, like Andy was saying, been pretty nice to do in quarantine, just to have some, you know, sense of fulfillment a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that I'm 100% in the kind of figuring out what I want to do phase, and that's totally fine. Um, so that's, that's all my, that's my two cents. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Iris, do we have more questions? Right now, we do not. We've been answering them as well offline. Oh, um, yeah. I can't wait to see what they were. I'm so glad that you guys are um, doing that. Um, do we have a poll that we could submit? Yeah, I was thinking about ocean exploration. If oh, you're yes? interested about talking about that, yeah. Do we have a fishing poll? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> All right, what is it? Go ahead and pop it in there. Yeah, we are asking you guys, how. what do you think about how much of the ocean has been explored? So 5%, 10%, or 15%. I love seeing the answers pop in. It's so satisfying. Thank you, guys. Yes. Okay. Feedback. Feedback. Instant. Instant, instant. instant feedback. Yeah. I, I need that instant. <laughs> Okay, so far with 81% reporting, I people are saying 5%. Scott, what do yeah, you Yeah, I'm going to say we're going to change that poll for next time because I think if you put the lowest number, people are biased oh, towards that. that. We might have a skewed one. Oh, I'm going to pick the lowest. That's me just thinking as an um, education researcher. But um, yes, you guys are absolutely right. Um, it's about 5%. Uh, one of the really cool things, and maybe Iris, you can put this in the chat, is we work with the Ocean Education Trust, um, and they have a really, um, a really awesome ship called the EV Nautilus. EV stands for Exploration Vessel, um, and they go out, and all they do is exploration. They map parts of the ocean that we haven't mapped, um, and then they go exploring if they see anything cool in the mapping uh, that they do. And for the last couple of years, They've been running up and down the um, in the East Pacific, so that would be the West Coast of the U.S. Um, and we have a partnership with them where we send undergraduates out um, to help um, do the work on that ship, or also communicate because they have um, what's called telepresence. And just like we are zooming now, they um, have a live interaction. You can see what's going on real time. Um, with their uh, work and you can ask them questions. It's very cool. The, uh, the um, founder and CEO or former CEO of the Ocean Education Trust and the um, man behind the madness that is Nautilus is Dr. Robert Ballard. He was the guy that discovered the Titanic. Um, and 
he, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, he's also a gaucho. So he went to UCSB for his undergrad. So um, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's about all I got on that. Any new questions coming in? Yeah, there was one from Owen that I feel like I could address a little bit. Oh, um, where's Owen, Owen from? Uh, they're from Denver, Colorado, which is Denver, pretty cool. Colorado. My cousin oh my lives gosh. there. <laughs> I love Denver. Um, I have a buddy that lives up in Greeley. He runs the Pooter Learning Center, which is very much like the Reef, but it's fo focused on the um, riparian zone associated with the Pooter Lacache River, which runs out of um, the the um, Rockies. And uh, he works, like I work with UCSB, he works with Colorado, um, oh my gosh, what is it? Colorado State University up there in Fort Collins. Anyway, so I spend a lot of time out there in Denver. You guys have a really cool automotive museum out there. Um, and uh, Denver is just a beautiful place. And obviously the Rockies. All right, Iris, fire it away. Yeah, Owen was asking about if there are any people that major in marine sciences and then go into the field of documentary slash filmmaking. And I, right when I saw this question, I had a million thoughts in my head because there's, I think what's really cool about UCSB is that there's so many ways to incorporate your passion into your major. So for example, okay, if you like marine sciences and filmmaking, you could major in aquatic biology and then get involved with film groups on campus like Magic Lantern, um, anything like that. Or you could do a double major for an ESBA which allows you to do that pretty easily. You could get a film degree and an ES degree, which would still allow you to have a marine emphasis, or you could do a film degree, just that, but then get involved with like the reef or something like that, get involved in the lab and incorporate your uh, marine science knowledge into that. So there's so many different ways to incorporate your passion for both here. Yeah, Scott. we have the media arts and technology department. Um, and actually we work with them uh, and this is really cool because if you look up, let's see if I can get it. Can you guys see there that camera? So, um, so I worked with a grad student uh, in media arts and technology that um, was curious about just what they did is they filmed the fish swimming around the tank and then they digitized the images into colors. Because um, if you guys have ever been to a dentist's office or a doctor's office, a lot of times they have aquaria in there because they're very therapeutic and calming. And so they were working with this cancer center in Oklahoma. And the question was asked, is it really the fish or is it the movement? And so they digitized these images. They set up a tank in this um, cancer um, treatment facility. And at one end of the room, they had a real tank. And the other end of the room, they had a um, uh, uh, virtual tank that had these shapes from the reef fish moving around. I'm not going to tell you the outcome uh, because I, I can't. Their research is still in um, or it's in publication, but um, you guys could look that up. Very cool stuff like that. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've got the virtual reef. So I actually have a couple of new interns that I hired that have um, filmmaking and video backgrounds and an interest in that. Um, and so like Iris said, you could go into, you could fully major in media arts and technology, film media and stuff like that, and do a minor or dabble in research uh, and, and do things like that. So very cool. Um, James Cameron uh, is a very successful filmmaker, yes. He made the, um, the movie Titanic avatar he has a strong background in marine biology he loves the ocean all of the the things organisms in avatar were based on marine critters he is very interested in ocean exploration as well um with bob ballard they kind of are very big personalities and they sort of compete for the limelight but he developed a new submersible it's gone the deepest of any submersible now so it's kind of really cool he made his money in filmmaking, but he's spending it in ocean exploration uh, and education. So cool stuff like that. You know, 
it's ideas. It's these out of the box ideas um, that are what make people um, successful and happy in their life. And so that's one of the things that we really uh, try and cultivate here at the Reef and at UCSB. There are so many different opportunities across campus, so many different departments. So like I said, if you come in with like um, Josie and you don't know, that's awesome. You sh maybe you shouldn't know, right? If you come in with an idea, don't be afraid um, to change it. You can change your major. Uh, I think there's research out there that, that says um, undergraduates or at least uh, 10 years ago, when I started looking at the data on this, they said that the, under, the average undergrad changes their major four times during their academic undergraduate academic career. Now, if you think about that, not very hard, you're like, oh, that's once a year. You can't do that, right? By the time you get into your um, junior year, you've got to kind of be on track for your upper division classes to get done in four years. Um, so that means you're changing your major twice a year for the first two years, potentially. And that's totally okay, right? Like I said, that is normal and natural to do. Oh my gosh, look at all the different flavors of ideas and uh, areas of academic interest. Um, and UCSB has one of the most diverse um, de uh, academic departments across um, the campus. So lots of it in, uh, interesting ideas. I know I hated tomatoes as a kid and now I love them. So um, don't be afraid to change your mind and don't be afraid to change colleges too. There's what, how many UCs, 10, nine? Maybe Jane knows. Jane, do you know? Nine. Oh. nine. Nine campuses across the state of California. And so you can transfer in within those colleges too. Maybe you come here, you're like, eh, I actually I wanna do veterinary stuff and Davis has a much better program transfer to Davis. It, they, they, it's very easy to do it once you're in a UC. Or maybe you're at Davis and you're like, ah, I really, well, I don't want to say marine science because Davis actually has a really cool connection with the Bodega Marine Lab, um, which is out on the coast. Um, but let's say you're interested in ag science to begin with and you go to some place, I don't know if they do ag science in, um, what's the one inland? Um, Merced. Actually, I think Merced is really hardcore into like biotech research. Um, so maybe that's what your interest is. And then you're like, yeah, I want to be closer to the beach. Then you can transfer um, here as well. So uh, I think that's about all we have time. Do we have more questions, Iris?